condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating. There were stripes upon his back. And he wore a crown of thorns upon his head. And he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death. Down the Via Dolorosa called the way of suffering like a
early in the morning. All the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how they were going to have Jesus executed. Jesus before Pilate. Meanwhile, Jesus be stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You have said so. When he was accused by the chief priest, the elders gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Do you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of their self-interest that he handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Do not have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Then Pilate saw he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was starting. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged, hand him over to be crucified.
Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him, laughing, slapping. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it upon his head in mockery. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit upon him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off his robe, bare him naked, put his own clothes upon him, then led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, where they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders of society mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Well, let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And in the same way, the very rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults upon him as he was dying. you to stand with us and sing in worship once more.
From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sebathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. What's capture the most profound theology? The hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross on Which the Prince of Glory Died, describes for us an event that cannot be taken in in a moment or a frame of our life, but is meant to be surveyed. Um, George Herbert wrote a lengthy poem called The Sacrifice. I'll read you a couple stanzas. He writes from the perspective of Jesus bearing his cross, atoning for our sins, and he writes these words, O all ye who pass by, whose eyes and mind 
to worldly things are sharp, but to me blind. To me, who took eyes that I might you find, was ever grief like mine? O oh, all ye who pass by, behold and see, man stole the fruit, and I must climb the tree, the tree of life to all, to all but me. Ever was there grief like mine? The cross shows us brought together inseparably both the incredible kindness of God despite our sin and the incredible sinfulness of us. We sung of Jesus as the dearest and best. When I was young, someone handed me the book, Your God is Too Small, by J.B. Phillips. A marvelous book. And one of the things that struck my soul is J.B. Phillips said, Jesus could have appeared in any culture and in any age and he would have been executed. The cross shows that we would take the one who has all the power to exercise evil from this world and we would perform a reverse exorcism upon him to the one who alone could exercise the world's demons. Jesus was cast out in the most demonstrable, violent, and aggressive way. And we have to ask the question, why? Why would it be necessary for God's son to die in such a peculiarly horrible way? We are talking, when we talk about the cross, of government-sponsored torture and execution. I don't think they ever thought we would make it a necklace and a decoration and an inspirational uplift. Jesus was on the cross not merely showing us something, but something was actually happening. And it's often avoided. I'm grateful for the beautiful steeple on the ceiling, on the roof of CLC. It shines in the night. From where I live, the leaves are off the tree. I, it's the most beautiful sight. I love the steeple. But what I love most about that steeple is at the very top of it, there is a cross. You know, one of the saddest things is in New England, as churches declined and moved away from the gospel of the New Testament, those crosses on top of steeples and spires were perhaps very parabolically replaced with weather vanes. Move with the wind, no real message. Part of us wants to pole vault from Palm Sunday to Easter. And the gospel writers will not allow it. This week is meant to be marked. And the gospel writers speak especially of the unexpected horror of Jesus being taken, and yet he makes no fight. Uh, but he is taken and he's virtually abandoned and accused by every single possible group. It's as though Matthew and the Matthew 27 was the scriptures that were read. Jesus is abandoned by his followers. He's abandoned by Judas, who completely defected. He's abandoned 
by Peter who lost all of his fleshly braggadocio confidence. So the apostles, which they all, the rest of the apostles abandoned him as well. He's abandoned by his own. He's abandoned by Israel. He's abandoned by Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of Justice, in a complete mockery of a trial. And then he's abandoned uh, by the Jewish people who populated the mobs. But make no mistake, he was also abandoned by the Romans. He was abandoned by the Roman military guard. He was mocked mercilessly by the soldiers. And he was shouted down, crucify him, and mocked in the crowds even as he died on the cross. Tom Holland is a great historian. He was interviewed by Nicky Gumbel and he is not yet a Christian, I believe. Maybe he's crossed that line. But he said this in his interview with Nicky Gumbel. He said, you know, if you are publicly crucified, what I can't get beyond is you are serving as a kind of billboard for the oppressing power. You were the lowest of the low. You were unable to protect your eyes from being plucked out by carrion birds. And, and the story of the crucifixion and resurrection is the most astounding story ever told because it reaches deep into the heart and soul and it explains what it means to be human. I see the crucifixion not as an event, but the pivot on which the whole cosmos turns and he says as I look around the world on this good Friday the whole world seems shrouded around a cloud of darkness and you would think that that would weaken the foundations of the Christian story but it kind of strengthens it it stares darkness in the face like no other story does it's not just the horrors and scales of crucifixion but the story is focused on who is the one suffering this It's the divine Jesus suffering the rocking, torturous death on a cross. And it seems like the abyss is celebrating the divine amidst the glories of heaven celebrating, even as the demons of hell were celebrating it. But the darkness of Good Friday is celebrated because it is the light and the light to come. And the light of Easter is more radiant because of the darkness that preceded it. He goes on to say this. I can't believe this man is not a Christian because this is better preaching than I grew up with. He says, to be a Christian is to believe that God became man and suffered a death as terrible as any mortal has ever suffered. This is why the cross, the ancient implement of torture, remains what it has always been, the fitting symbol of the Christian revolution It is the audacity of it, the audacity of finding in a twisted and defeated corpse the glory of the creator of the universe that serves to explain more surely than anything else the sheer strangeness of Christianity and the civilization to which it gave birth. Today, the power of this strangeness remains as alive as it ever has been around the world. It is manifest in the greatest surge of conversions that has swept Africa and Asia over the past decades. It is the conviction of millions upon millions by the breath of the Spirit, like a living fire still blows in our world. And so the cross is this this combination of things, the divine loving Son of God, as Isaiah said, whose image was marred more than that which ever has been and has become the the greatest recognizable symbol in the world. And so what is it that Christ was accomplishing? What is it that it was accomplished that for Christ to die such a horrific death? You won't find in the gospel writers a great dwelling upon the physical suffering of Christ, it's there, it's understood, but, but they dwell upon that Jesus was accomplishing something. Paul writes that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now that is an accomplishment. 
And here is how Paul phrases it in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, he was reconciling the world to himself, not counting trespasses against them, and entrusting a message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Boy, what a night it would be if you entered here not reconciled to God. How could anyone here, as this is unfolded before us, not leave knowing that they have been reconciled to God? And here is the verse that I think is the greatest summary, 15 words that is the greatest summary of the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the word of God says, for our sake, God made the one who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. These words seem to strain to explain something to us. It says, for our sake, there was nothing in it for him. God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Fleming Rutledge, who wrote a masterful book on the crucifixion, says no one understands what exactly it means when it says God made Christ to be sin. How could the Son of God be sin? We have to understand that Paul understands sin not as an accumulation of misdeeds, but as a power with a death grip on the whole human race. And in these words, it sounds as though Jesus somehow was overtaken by the dread power of sin or somehow was assimilated into the power of sin and was held imprisoned by sin in some way that was commensurate with sin's annihilating intentions. And yet, Paul wants it to be very clear to us that Jesus is sinless. Not only sinless, he knew no sin. And he joins these two ideas. Jesus knew no sin, none. But he was made to be sin, comprehensively. And he brings these two phrases. He knew no sin, he was made to be sin. Not in separate quarters, but right smack together. How could one who knew no sin be made sin? He brings those two things together in direct proximity to, in essence, heighten the shock of what is being said. Paul doesn't merely say Jesus never sinned. That's true, he never sinned. But he says Jesus never knew sin. It says he knew no sin. He was not tainted with sin in the least. And so he's saying more than Jesus did not commit sin. He's saying Jesus perfect, holy humanity. Sin is not merely something that we commit. Jesus never committed sin, but it is the power that holds you and me helplessly in its thrall. We cannot spend a moment without being in the midst of sin and knowing sin. But through the crucifixion, Jesus entered into sin's power. Uh, No other mode of death would have been equal uh, and match the extremity of your condition and my condition in sin and he was condemned he was scourged mercilessly he was tied to a pole exposing his back and flesh He, he was rendered helpless and powerful his arms were almost stretched out of their sockets his wrists and ankles were pierced with nails thicker than my finger he was pinned like an insect onto the planks that he was he was nailed to, given the death uh, below a slave. And he was put in this place where holding himself there in the bones of his wrist uh, and and pierced uh, through his ankles, he was self-asphyxiating, he was suffocating, and and just like the, the weight of Jesus' own body hanging there made every exhale an effort and worked to, in a sense, suffocate Jesus by his own weight, just as his own body hanging there was executing him, um, he took sin. He took the hideousness of sin into himself. 
Just as his own body turned against him on the cross, smothering and killing him, he had to hoist himself up with great excruciating pain on the the nail that was through both of his ankles so that he could gasp for a, a, a breath. And it was undoubtedly during those breaths that he uttered the seven sentences or sayings that we have recorded in the Gospels. As he's hanging there on the cross and the the Roman soldiers discovered that um, there was some contest about the clothes of Jesus. Perhaps they they had the outer garment and and the inner garment and uh, his sandals and his turban. And there was some contest. He, he was watching them roll the dice to see who could get the contested garment. And as he saw that, he breathed and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As the thieves in the crowd around mocked him, and some have suggested that because the Jews didn't want Pilate's sign to be interpreted literally that he was the king. They said, we need to mock him to show that this is not our king. That probably was why those dying next to Jesus picked it up. They picked up the mocking from the crowd. And as the the thieves, who were guilty of not just thievery, but probably a capital offense, murdering in their thievery, it was then that Jesus said to the penitent thief, To the one who said, remember me, Lord, who was struck with repentance, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, what satisfaction to Jesus as he was enduring, completing the work of atoning for sin, that he could snatch one trophy of a repentant human being to himself. And then he had the wherewithal, as he was dying, as he was smothering from the weight of his body, to look down to his terrified youngest disciple, John, who, who may have still been in his teens, and to see his mother standing there with the other women. The women's courage is amazing. Knowing that he would leave his mother, knowing that his other brothers... Uh, were not yet believing, he said to John, he said, behold your mother. And then looking to his mother, he had the wherewithal to say, as he was dying, as he was leaving her, behold your son. He was placing her in the, in the family of God. The, the first church was being formed. Um, this was part of the, the joy set before Jesus as he had despised the cross and despised the shame, yet for the joy of building the Christian family. And so he spoke these incredible, incredible words of grace until he came to the next to last utterance that he would make Balancing himself on that nail, gasping for air, he said, it is finished. Meaning that all of the sacrifice, all of the religious attempts, all of the moral attempts to atone for sin and to somehow wipe ourselves clean, he had displaced and replaced and anything that could ever be done, anything that could be done, anything that will be done has been done through Jesus and with joy he said it is finished and having said that he knew that he could now leave this planet, his work was completed he prayed in the words of Psalm 31 Father into your hands I commit my spirit and he breathed his last completing redemption. And tonight, beyond just tenderizing our hearts to love him, we need to say, do we know for certain that we have been reconciled, forgiven, made part of Jesus' family, at one with him through his cross? Have we responded Have we responded to the one who was forsaken for us? 
but was forsaken because of love for us and was bringing us out of our bondage to sin and to that power by submitting to that very power and coming under its power so that he might forgive us. All of the parallels of Jesus' trial show us what God was giving us this great exchange. We give him our sin. He gives us his righteousness. Um, Jesus, the only innocent, condemned. We who are only guilty are set free by that same verdict. And it's as simple as that response of that thief on the cross. And it's a choice we make one time that changes our destiny for all eternity but it is also an ongoing calling of our Christian life to turn from sin in repentance and to marvel at what our sin cost Christ. If we think of sin but lightly, nor behold its evil great, here we view the nature of sin rightly, here the guilt of sin we can estimate. And before we go into a time of just repenting, examining our hearts, bringing our sin to Christ, who gladly washes, purges, and releases the grip of sin to us, I want to read you the words of an ancient poem that was sent to a hymn contemplating the death of Christ. It says, ah, holy Jesus, how hast thou offended that we to judge thee have in hate pretended by foes derided, by thine own rejected, O oh, most afflicted. Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason, Jesus, hath undone thee. Twas I, Lord Jesus, it was I denied thee, I crucified thee. Lo, the good shepherd, for the sheep is offered. The slave, us, hath sinned, and the son hath suffered. For our atonement, while we nothing heeded, God interceded. For me, kind Jesus, was thy incarnation thy mortal sorrow and thy life's oblation, thy death of anguish and thy bitter passion for my salvation. Therefore, kind Jesus, since I cannot pay thee, I do adore thee, and I will ever pray thee Think on thy pity and thy love unswerving, not my deserving. I want us to make room for closing this service and letting God speak to us. And we're going to enter a time, there'll be opportunity to just reflect in your seat. Um, to come forward. Uh, we have some prayer benches there. You can kneel on the stairs. You're handed a white sheet of paper. And if you would like, you can take and write some sins, some troublesome sins, some sins you're aware of that you want to bring to God for cleansing. Um, if you don't want to write them, you can simply write them with your finger. <laughs> And fold the paper. And we have three crosses down here, and we have a bunch of nails and hammers. And we're going to invite you as we worship to just do symbolically what we do spiritually. That we confess our sins. We take them to Christ. We don't clean ourselves up. We don't wait until we've performed some acts of penance or proof of our sincerity. We take them right now. 
We bring them before him, and he is the one who bears them. The Bible says he cancels out our sin, and he removes them far away from us. And I invite you to enter into that. Again, we've had a cro- we have crosses in each aisle. Time just for some reflection. And time to join in some of the singing that heralds the great accomplishment of Jesus for us. Let's draw near to him. Let's cleanse our hearts and our hands of anything that is not of him. And let's leave here without a sense of any burden of our own sin, but the burden to please him.
The suffering and glory of the servant. See my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. What they have not heard, they will understand. He who believed our message, and to whom has the arm of God, the arm of the Lord, been revealed? He grew up before him like a, t like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised 
rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from those whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and he held, we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and his wounds we were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a sheep to slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears was silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for our sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied <clears throat> by his knowledge, by his righteous servant will, be just, will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he has poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the story of a son of God hanging on a cross for me but it ends with the bride and groom and a wedding by a glassy sea oh death where is your sting cause I'll be there singing
the bride and groom at a wedding by a glassy sea. Singing, oh death, where is your sting? Cause I'll be there singing holy, holy. That concludes our service, but we want to encourage you to not begin conversations in here and just allow a season for those who'd like to linger in here. You may want to have some further time of prayer, but just to leave this room in silence and then commence your conversations outside. Um, encourage you to come Sunday for the rest of the story. <laughs> and lift up your hearts. Oh God, may you seal to our hearts the cost of our forgiveness as the display of your love. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.